In the central highlands of Barbados lies one of nature's greatest wonders. This breathtaking, beautiful limestone cavern is a testament to nature's mastery that has grown undisturbed for thousands of years. These were the landscapes in which our pre-ancestors made their first homes. But over the centuries, we developed sugarcane fields, we planted various food crops, we erected buildings and constructed pathways above this wonder, unaware of its existence. In making our mark on this landscape, we develop things of beauty and in so doing, we turn nature into culture. It is a cultural act. It cannot have happened without a human's hand. This basic act was the foundation of human culture in the Harris Gully, which we are about to explore in Art Out of Nature, Harrison's Cave, Barbados. Hello and welcome to Art Out of Nature, Harrison's Cave, Barbados. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. In this series, we shall take a look at the rediscovery of the cave back in the 1970s, its development, its early operation, and we shall look towards the future. Now, this is Harrison's Cave today. We are here in the valley floor. But the story of the cave began centuries ago, one mile away from here, in an area known as Harris Gully. It is at that point where Senator Professor Sir Henry Fraser picks up the discussion and he places things in the correct perspective. The story of Harrison's Cave is absolutely fascinating. It was first described by a man called George Pinkard. He was a visitor to Barbados and he wrote an article which was dated February the 27th, 1796. That is more than 200 years ago. In fact, precisely 220 years ago, describing Harrison's Cave. And it was quite an interesting story. And it related the fact that they'd got lost because the lights had gone out and the guide had to return to the mouth of the cave and come back with lights while they sat in the dark wondering if they'd ever emerge. The two guys who took Dr. George Pinkard into the cave were enslaved Africans of Colonel Williams. This was evidence that the cave was known to the enslaved population of this area. We must also bear in mind that the unearthing of Amerindian artifacts is an indication that this group of people who lived here in harmony with their environment also knew of the existence of the cave. Now, the account of Dr. George Pinkard began after having breakfast at the house of Colonel Williams, the party set off refreshed in spirits of adventure. They descended this area, they took the left turn and walked for about a mile before entering through Harris Gully. What follows now is a verbatim account of Dr. Pinkard on seeing the Africans return with lights to guide him out of the cave. But the voice of the good colonel who had accompanied them soon roused us from our reverie and reminded us that however dismal our abode, it was not that born from whence no travellers return. We now hastened to change our bed of darkness for brighter regions, but were obliged to tread our way in cautious steps towards the exit of the cave, for the path was intricate and perilous. As we approach the opening, we extinguish the artificial lights in order to enjoy the appearance of the soft rays which stole in at the entrance of the cave, richly gliding the rocks and petrifactions, and gradually, though irregularly, increasing until we again met the brightness of day. Now, Schomburg, in his famous book, uh, Sir Robert Schomburg, his publication, The History of Barbados in 1848, the definitive history up to that time, Schomburg thought that Harrison's was not of great significance. He was more interested in Cole's Cave, which is part of that same St. Thomas Cave system, but not directly connected 
uh, with Harrison's and he dismissed Harrison's as not being terribly important and people forgot about Harrison's it seems. Now forgotten for more than 150 years. Now 37 years earlier in 1759 the Reverend Griffith Hughes writing about his exploration of caves in Barbados referred to Cole's Cave as by far the most worthy of our notice. He made no mention of Harrison's cave. Clearly, he had no knowledge of its existence. Before we discuss its rediscovery, let us take into consideration the locals' knowledge of what we have come to know as Harrison's cave and the surrounding areas. Retired school teacher, Winston Archer. I've been a resident of this area for my, all my life. I remember the valley floor. In fact, just behind me is where, where I used to live. Just behind this um, area here is where I used to live. Our land is um, batting abound to this, the Harsons Cave. Before my time, it was told that down here was a cricket ground. Fellows used to play cricket in this area many, many years ago. And they would have had a pitch and everything. There was a huge plastic tree at the back of me. And you know, they would make bats from these plastic fast, this tree because the plastic tree is a very, very hard wood. And they would um, play cricket down here. But they say, on, especially on Sundays, somebody would bring a, a bag of coconuts and the fellas would throw at them for a fee. If you hit it, knock it off over, the coconut was yours. So all of this before my time. Now, what about Mr. Archer's time and his personal experiences of this area? As small children, just come down here and have some activity. But I remember to get down to, to this valley floor, we would come down on coconut limbs. We would put the limb out and we would get the, the limb and get on it and slide down the hill because it had a slope. And we would do that all the time. We would come down here cook. You get away from our parents, we would come down here. Somebody would bring some lard oil, somebody would bring some salt, somebody would bring some, some butter. In fact, every person in that group will have to bring something. And that is what we used to do. We come down here, we cook. Stop the whole day. Sometimes the whole day, we would be down here, getting away from our parents, not doing mischief, but cooking, playing, or whatever, exploring the gullies. And if you look around, you can see all the um, the, the holes, the, the rock holes and thing that we used to um, engage in our in our in our in our play. We also used to come down here and because we've had some bees and things like that, it used to be in, this, in the hills. We would come and we would, they had a man named Mr. Beckles, he would smoke the bees, but then he would reach in and take the, um, the bees, the, um, the honey from the, from the, from the hive. The, if you look around, you can see the, those vines hanging from the, the walls. We would, we would say, we were Tarzan, we would swing on the, on the list. Above here, just above us, so to, the, to my left, was a ground called Big Tate. And that is where the, the car park is and the, the administration centers are. And we would go there, we would go up here and collect canes from the field, throw them down the bottom, especially if they were juicy cane. We would, because you know juicy cane is very soft, we would go up there, throw them down, and we would have our cane at the bottom. When the, when the watchman comes, he won't find us, right? Because the cane's at the bottom already. And all of those things we, we, would, we, would, we would do from, from time to time. Now, was there anything else that was done in the gully from time to time? The gully, the gully was a meeting place for, for, for fellas. You know, yeah, if you're a fellow man, you can come in, you can, you can sneak in, and you, you know, it's fairly, fairly private, fairly, um, 
you know, you, boy can't see you. And you come in, you, you come and you, you, meet a, you meet a girl. You might not come in the same direction. She come from one direction, you come from the other. You hear me? And that's how it was. Fellas used to meet in here and meet. I believe they still do meet. <laughs> Typical childhood days. All of this was being done oblivious to the existence of this natural wonder that would eventually welcome thousands of visitors from all over the world and become a major foreign exchange earner for Barbados. We never knew that there was really a, a cave down here as such. But what we do know is that from stories from well diggers, they would say that they were digging a well and the drill just went through. So we knew that there was something um, on towards about this place. We, we had water just rushing into holes and things like that and disappearing. We never knew why, but we always thought, thought that there was something. Like Winston Archer, David Carrington is also a resident of the area. He too knew absolutely nothing about Harrison's cave. Never knew of Harrison scale, you hear about, we used to call it Harris Gully at the time, but most of the residents were familiar with Cole's scale, which is just a stone throw from here. And um, traditionally every Good Friday, the youngsters would get their smart lamps, as the bottle lamps were cursing all in a week, and head over to Cole's scale. Cole's scale used to be an area that we go into every Good Friday, every Good Friday you find a lot of people going to Cold cool Cave. Now, what was memorable about those Good Friday exploration of Cold Cave was hearing the organ of Holy Innocence Church being played as the eager explorers walked and crawled throughout the cave. Many stories have been told of the explorers singing along the hymns being sung by the choir and congregation of the Holy Innocence Anglican Church. But younger people, when they have vacation, they will go every day. You go into Coast Cave, you try to, to, um, to get somebody. Because I don't know if you ever went to Coast Cave, but you have to go down a slippery path. And then when you get down to the hole, you have to hold down a little while, for a little while and then stand up. What fellas used to do? when they know that you were inside, they would get a lot of trash, a lot of cane blades, and light the mouth of the cave so that you couldn't get out. So uh, all you had to do though is wait until um, it died down, the, the, the fire died down, and then you would come out, you know? But it was fun for us, really. Stories have been told about individuals, particularly children, who entered Cole's cave and experienced difficulties as they sought to return to the surface. There was a time that some children went in. Well, they knew, people knew that they went in, and by a certain time they would have to come back out. What happened is that all the flambeaux and things like that um, went out for everybody. So what they did is just huddle in thing one place, and then knowing that somebody knew that they were in there, they waited until they were rescued, right? But another thing is that you, you, you can go into there and you, if you don't have your own markers, you don't know where you're going, you can get lost in there because there are a lot of tunnels in there. Residents and Cold Cave explorers often spoke of Bat Island and how the produce of Bat Island was used as fertilizer for a major crop on a neighboring plantation. There's a place called Bat Island you can go across there and it used to be, I, I, they would say that Walk Spring, the plantation just above, they used to take a lot of the um, guano from the, they would go in with their trail, their, their, their um, dung baskets, and bring it and throw it to the, to the, to the, um, the, 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 the canes and things like that. But when you go to Bat Island, Bat Island was bear bats, and you find the guano was, was high up in the air like a mountain. And you, sometimes you, 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 you try to squeeze past and things like that. Or you, some people even go up into the, into the 
um, you down. And that was fun. I threw out people and that kind of thing. <laughs> that was called scave and the extent of the children's enjoyment. Now, what about Harrison's scave? But to gain entry into Harrison's cave, you know, no, nobody really knew about it. We were a bit suspicious when we saw Tony and Ole on days, you know, just visited the gully. But we weren't really aware of what was going on. Ole Sorensen was a Danish speleologist, and speleologist is a lovely word for people who like to go down into deep, dark holes in the ground. And Ole was a very professional, very able speleologist who had heard about and read about the Harrison Cave, and he was determined to find it. He, he um, explored the area, explored the caves, and he, sometimes he would see him as a schoolboy, he would come through, come out and for the school bus. And we would see him, he and Tony Mason and one or two other people coming out looking muddy and dirty from um, Rachmahal Gully and some other caves. We would, some other holes, because we consider them holes. And what we realized then that, <laughs> that they were really exploring this Harrison's cave business. Now, the National Trust was the, if you like, the guardian of our heritage from way back in 1961, when it was founded by the late Ronald Free, who was one of the greatest English Barbadian philanthropists who built Heron Bay and did so many things for Barbados. Ronald Free was the president of the trust, so it was natural for Ole Sorensen, with his connections, to go to the trust, whose mission was the preservation of natural and built sites of interest, and the trust, therefore, was his sponsor. He worked with the trust in the days of Sir Donald Wiles as director, Paul Foster as president, and he did the exploration, and the trust was very, very excited about this. Ole was not alone. Accompanying him on these expeditions was what we refer to as one of the local heroes of Harrison's Cave, one of the men whose name is today emblazoned throughout the cave because of his outstanding contribution from exploration until his retirement. Now, how did a then young Tony Mason become involved with cave exploration in Barbados? As a youngster, I had uh, excursions from churches and things taking me into the country. I find a spot for my mother to set up the food thing and I gone. I was in the bush and looking. This is how we managed to find caves in St. Philip and St. George, yeah. St. John. Uh. But it was only in 1969 when I saw that there was five Danish explorers in the island. I wrote them a letter and a reply. And this is when I started my caving experience with them. And I mean real caving, which was fun and exciting. Sorensen went back to the States, I think it was, in 1970. And I thought that this was the end of everything. But then, again, at around July, he wrote back a letter asking me if I would work with him, exploring the kids of Barbados. And this was one big opportunity. I jumped at it. For Tony Mason, this was an opportunity of a lifetime. Little did he know that his contribution was destined to generate the much needed foreign exchange for Barbados. I started with him and I work about, I would say about a lifetime. Well, we went in several caves before this, lots of them. And when he found this, it was like dropping the rest to deal with this because we wanted to turn this into a tourist attraction. And it meant that we was here constantly, every day, every morning, to late at night exploring. How did they stumble upon Harrison's Cave? It is recorded that the explorers entered Harrison's Cave through an opening in Welchman Hall Gully. But Tony Mason, who was an active participant on the explorers' team, is adamant that the team entered Harrison's Cave through Harris Gully. Winston Archer now describes Harris Gully. Just beyond Nichols' farm is the um, Harris Gully. And, and there is a lot of wells and a lot of... I think one, at one stage, the water, water authority used to, used to utilize that, that area 
for water. If you go into Harris Gully, which stretches from all up there back down to um, Coast Cave, you'll find that there's still a lot of um, old metal um, pipes down there. It seems as though they used to, um, the waterworks used to use gullies as a means of, 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 of transporting the um, lady pipes to get the water system going. Later in the program, Tony Mason will speak about an experience of entering Harrison's cave through Welshman Hall Gully, but this, he insists, occurred only after they had first entered from Harris Gully. We entered in Harris Gully. We was walking through Harris Gully, and we took a break. One of the chaps was sitting down, and we, I think he tossed a rock back behind, or banana skin or something, but we didn't hear it hit the ground. So curiosity took us over the little incline, only to see formations like I show you at the natural entrance, and there it was one hole. We went into the hole and we could see the suck from like bottle lamps or whatever by other people that went to that point. But about 50 feet, like I tell you, we came to this siphon of water that was touching the roof and the floor, and that was it. So we had to dive this water get behind it and start lowering it off and then going through, head back, sucking the wind, sucking as much wind as you can get off of the ceiling in order to dig out the rest of it. And from there it was uphill, downhill, diving, lowering water and coming down. But it was good because the more we did this, the more cave was, was being found, discovered. The daily exploration of the cave was an adventure which Tony Mason looked forward to eagerly. I, I used to wait early in the morning just to go into a cave. I remember when we found the upper part of Harrison's Cave in Vetsman Hall Gully, it was the evening about six o'clock, and he was searching all the sides and they were sitting down just by a rock. And I don't mean to take credit for this, but I was sitting down and they saw this rock and they take my hand and trade it and it dropped inside it. So when I come back, let me check this. It was no bigger than the side of your head. But we dig it out and push in and we could see that it was continuing. And we had to leave it to go home to come back the next morning so that night I didn't sleep. Because I wanted to know what was going on. And that part of the cave it's so beautiful, the key of straws is coming from the ceiling right down to the floor. We found a crimson color, and I, I was wondering if somebody threw a bird or paint up top, you know, it was crimson red, but he never paid it in the mind, and I was just playing with it. So I don't know if back then the Arawaks had some sort of stuff that they used to put on the face with it, and they jumped to this conclusion. I could be wrong, but it was really, a beautiful rain, like this thing, beautiful rain. We crawl to avoid breaking out any formations. This was rule number one. In, in any cave, rule, there's rules. Take nothing but pictures, leave, leave nothing but footsteps. We had to destroy some of the cave straws in order to get through the passage to come right down to from in Bryan Road, on the Bryan Road, to the place that I show you when we was coming in. The rotunda room was intact and beautiful. The formations were like crystal, crystal, and, and just touching the, the slightest one, you would get a, either a break off and it would hurt the heart, or you would touch it and you would hear a sound like a tongue, you know? Other than this, the rotunda room was splendid. It was, and it still is. Having entered through Harris Gully and stumbled upon what is known as Explorer's Pool, the task of crawling along the narrow stream, eager to see what awaited them, continued. After coming down up to where you call it Explorer's Pool now that was dug out, the former pool, it was like a narrow channel. 
good, and we had to do some diving, yes, to get into the big room. After that, there was two passages, Twin Falls, and another Twin Falls, sorry. there was like two falls coming down. So we took the first one, and we battled into the big room. That's when we saw the original Great Hall, as we call it. Now, as you listen to the description of the exploration as told by Tony Mason, who accompanied Ole, it is clear that Ole was guided by the account written by Dr. George Pinkard of the Royal College of Physicians, dated February 27, 1797, and published in London in 1806. You would recall that two enslaved Africans of Colonel Williams took him on a guided tour of the cave. It appears as if Ole read the account of Pankard's store and he set out to do the same. And then we started going downstream. We explored all the little areas that I would show you when we go into the cave. And there's lots of little passages down there that are in develop. But we followed the water stream downstream and it kept going, sometimes up, sometimes down, diving, clearing, pushing back mud, you know. It involved crawling, swimming, unaware of the depth of water. This exploration took them all the way down to what is known today as the Cascade Pool area. Um, at Cascade Pool now, that was one long channel and it was developed into what you see now as Cascade Pool. Beyond that, which is about a mile in hill, downstream, quarter mile, up to that Mahal Gully, and 840 feet from Explorers Pool to the natural entrance. But it is a lot of crawl, and then you come to one big siphon of water where we had a diverse dive, but you can continue. But this water down there is like an ocean because you've got a dog paddle across it to come over to the other side. And the cave continue and continue right down where you're swimming to fresh water there. But to get there, we need more men or different men. You would recall that tradition has it that a party who wished to ascertain in what direction the stream flowed brought along a duck and place it in the water to be carried away by the current. Some days later, it was recovered nearly nine miles in a straight line from the cave in the vicinity of Freshwater Bay. Now, the explorer's daily task of trying to move safely throughout the cave and returning to the surface without hurting themselves was not without its challenges. Downstream is where we had some trouble trying to get through the clear part by digging out clear and removing clear to come to another siphon and this continued till we came to the biggest siphon that I've ever seen in any cave and this is when I tell you that we brought in some divers and he brought in some divers to dive it but no luck so then they did they do this as phase one and then go into phase two at a later date. How did Mr. Mason prepare for his daily entry into the dark and unknown? To answer this, he first shares an experience of another cave found in Bominston, St. John. When we, went, we had Richard Goddard, yes. and he had these chocolates and different sweets, along with some hard-boiled eggs. So when it was lunchtime, we eat these eggs. You couldn't eat them because the water had absorbed in them and you could squeeze the egg like this and get all the water out. In each of the caves that we went into, there's club hammers, which is a small heavy hammer, some drills, lots of crowbars. I mean, there's so much that we could open a hard way if we wanted to go back for them. I mean, after we left one more morning, we always used to find something to eat, breakfast, a heavy breakfast. We used to eat Kelly's lunch and meat, Tom Piper's stew, coconut bread, and drink coats. This was the basic lunch time and, 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 and dinner time when we come to the cave. It was only one time that somebody carried away all the lunch because we left them on the car. And we was really hungry at that time. We was just going to go to the <laughs> Well, there was someone on the surface who perhaps needed the explorer's lunch. They simply made light of the incident. 
courageous men whose exploration was beyond their imagination. This is how it all started. The story of the rediscovery of Harrison's cave, not in Welchman Hall Gully, but right here in Harris Gully. It was a job that brought Mr. Mason the greatest of pleasure. I must say that in my days of exploring cave with Sorensen, I think I was the happiest person in Barbados. Yeah, you, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing. I, I used to wake early in the morning just to go into a camp. This one was fun. This one was fun. Every time you go, you want to know what is around the next corner. And when you get around the next corner, it just opens up. And of course, that was a wonderful experience for Mr. Mason and the team of explorers. A sense of purpose and accomplishment. In our next episode, we shall take a look at the early development of Harrison's Cave back in the 1970s. Until next week, at the same time, I'm Sherwood McCaskey. This has been Art Out of Nature. <laughs>